Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Sentencing Project for today's webinar to discuss extreme sentencing in the United States and our landmark nationwide survey of life imprisonment entitled No End in Sight. You know, our report shows not only the data, but it also makes strong recommendations for fundamental change to our criminal legal system. And today, we fortunately also have the opportunity to discuss solutions and ideas for transformation with a panel of amazing experts. TSP's report, though, is meant to be a wake-up call for the nation to roll back the outdated, excessive, and racially motivated punishments of the past, and instead focus our limited resources on rational and fair public safety measures that invest in our people and our communities, not prisons. Right now, the Sentencing Project and our partners nationwide are committed to ending the destructive era of mass incarceration by working to change unfair and extreme laws while ensuring that adults and youth in prison right now get a second chance to show they are ready to return home and live productive lives in the community before it's too late. To that end, we are making bold proposals for changing the destructive course of mass incarceration in America, including a 20-year cap on all sentences with very, very few exceptions. And we know that not everyone is going to agree to this right now. But at the Sentencing Project, we believe that now actually is the moment to start talking about what's next in our long national journey to racial justice, to gender justice, and finally, to a just and fair criminal legal system. So today, we have a terrific lineup to help jumpstart that journey a little further down the road. Now, first, we are going to hear directly from the author of No End in Sight, one of the foremost experts on life imprisonment in America, and lucky for me, a colleague here at the Sentencing Project, a senior research analyst, Alishi, Ashley Nellis. I can say your name, Ashley. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks so much, Amy. And it's really um, just such uh, uh, an honor to be uh, on this panel, um, particularly with Sintoya and Salim, whose stories I followed for years while they were incarcerated and who, um, whose release I strongly supported. I most recently came to know Ronaldo, but he's fast becoming a close friend also, um, partly because he's in Chicago, which is my hometown, but also because he survived decades and decades of prison on an uh, unfair sentence. So um, I wanted to you know, just share with you um, some of the numbers from our most recent report. Um, and uh, as we've done in the past, we obtained Department of Corrections data from all the states and the federal government to produce these latest figures. I'm gonna um, attempt to share my screen here with you because I think it's easier to sort of follow along while you're looking at, um, at some figures. So I'm gonna do this and then I'm going to do this and hopefully that has taken everybody where they need to go. So uh, we find uh, that one in seven prisoners has a life sentence, uh, roughly the same as what we found in 2016, although within those figures, we find um, quite a bit of um, disturbing uh, trends, which I'll get a little bit into. Um, breaking it out, we see that about half of our lifer population is serving um, a life sentence, which is technically parole eligible. A lot of states um, do uh, grant parole uh, for lifers, but the extension of that time uh, before parole release um, is troubling. In some states, it's as long as 60 years. Um, I know Centoya could talk about that at length. Um, in Tennessee, it has the longest time before release for a life sentence with the possibility of parole, which is 60 years. Um, other states, it's as low as 20, but uh, typically um, individuals are looking to wait around three decades before they're released in some states. Um, life without parole is 55,000 people and virtual life, uh, which is 50 years or more, uh, before the potential for release, we include as a lifer, um, and that's about 42,000 people. 
every state in the US has life sentences of some sort. There's no statutory life sentence in the state of Alaska, but they have a substantially high number of people serving 50 years and more. Um, when I was saying just a moment ago that within the life sentence, even though the population of lifers is somewhat the same, <clears throat> the number of people serving the harshest life sentence, like without the possibility of parole, is continuing to rise at a very troubling rate, 6% in only the last four years. And that's when we account for the fact that there's been a substantial drop in the number of juveniles um, serving life without the possibility of parole. So J uh, LWAP is what it's called, is continuing to rise amid this sort of reform era that criminal justice system appear, uh, claims to be in. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, as in all stages of the criminal legal system, we find troubling racial disparities among those sentenced to the longest pun punishments. Nationally, we find that one in five Black men is serving a life sentence and that overall two thirds of people who are lifers are people of color. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna go to this one next. So violent offenses, do make up the majority of people who are serving life um, and particularly life without the possibility of parole. But the non-homicide, so still violent, but non-homicides are a growing share of the life sentence population that has um, certainly gotten my attention um, and suggests what we have uh, speculated, which is that um, this harsh punishment at the deep end of the uh, sentencing spectrum pushes other sentences up and ratchets them up such that sex-related offenses are, are a very quickly growing uh, fraction of the life sentence population, as well as uh, penalties uh, for aggravated assault um, and robbery. Um, uh, so I wanted to share also that um, you know, we find all of this to be profoundly troubling in the in an era where you know we've seen life imprisonment rise amid many years of declines in violent crime, and that you know there's established evidence that long-term imprisonment does not keep us any safer or work as a deterrent. Um, we find also that. Um, Juveniles, so these, when I say juveniles, I mean people who were under the age of 18 at the time of their crime. They've received a fair amount of attention in the legal um, uh, environment with uh, three Supreme Court rulings and one pending that have invalidated the use of life without parole on people who were under 18 um, in various scenarios, which essentially will uh, eliminate that sentence for um, uh, nearly all of those that were there originally. And the number of juveniles serving life without the possibility of parole, which you can see at the bottom right, has declined substantially, 48% from its peak, um, <clears throat> which is terrific news and shows that when we take these matters to court um, and we do it in the right way, we can really win. Um, however, there are still 10,000 young people who are serving life sentences of some form or another. The vast majority have life with the possibility of parole for crimes committed when they were under the age of 18. Um, Sintoya, who you'll hear from later, is, is was one of those. <clears throat> um, we're also taking a deeper look at women and girls because there are a small fraction, about 3% of the lifer population but a quickly growing share of that population. So if we look at women, uh, the number of women and girls who were under, uh, who were sentenced to life uh, back in 2003 and compare it to those in 2020, um, <clears throat> we see that there's been a growth in the men's rate by 29% and 43% for women. Uh, this mirrors uh, what's also happening in prison populations with women, um, uh, taking up more space in prisons than before and growing uh, more rapidly. Um, the 250 of these were under the age of 18 at the time of their crime. And then finally, we looked at the uh, elderly population for the first time in this census and found that more than 61,000 people 
are serving life sentences um, and are at least age 55 or older, which presents in our mind a, phys a fiscal and humanitarian crisis that is unparalleled in the world. Um, in many countries around the world, they don't even have life imprisonment to begin with, but they are, uh, they specifically exclude uh, people who are elderly um, from receiving life sentences. Whereas here, um, you know, we have this growing population of lifers and particularly in a time of COVID, there has been uh, far too little attention to uh, gain in, gaining their release for health reasons. Um, so as Amy said, before I turn it back over to her, we make you know, several bold uh, proposals in our report. And, we, um, uh, and among these are uh, the wish to abolish life without the possibility of parole wholesale with no exclusions. So that would be about 55,000 people. We are a very unique um, country in among our sister countries in the use of life without the possibility of parole. We also uh, make the proposal to cap all sentences at 20 years so that we begin to bring the entire sentencing spectrum back into one that's more proportionate uh, to crimes that people are convicted of. We also uh, make specific suggestions about how to reform parole boards and how to uh, force parole boards to accelerate uh, their uh, review process. And finally, reorienting victim participation. We see the role of victims uh, mostly as one of being taken advantage of by prosecutors and victim rights groups, but then abandoned and not given the true healing they deserve. So um, I think with that, I'm going to turn it back to Amy, and then she's going to turn it over to somebody else. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ashley. Every time I hear the data from the report, and I've read the report many times, it just fills me with a sense of urgency uh, that we can and must do better than the system that we've created. Unfortunately, today, we have a number of panelists with us that will help us on that journey to trying to rethink how we confront extreme sentencing in the United States. I'm gonna ask each panelist a question. I will do a brief introduction of them. Uh, I, because I'm the moderator and I'm such a fangirl for all of these amazing folks, I'm gonna take that prerogative and ask everyone a question that I have been dying to ask them. But then we will open up uh, the Q&A session to all of you. And I see that many of you have already put questions in Q&A. I will encourage you to do that at the bottom of your screen. Rather than use the chat function, please use the Q&A function so I can easily see it. I will take a look at the questions and kind of farm them out uh, and people can contribute and, and jump in. We want this to be as interactive as possible uh, because we are so excited to hear from, from everyone. But first, I'm going to give a little overview of who we've got on this expert panel today. Um, first is Ronaldo Hudson, who is the education director of the Illinois Prison Project, where he works to end perpetual punishment in Illinois and, and frankly, nationwide. And I want to just give a shout out to Ronaldo because we found out that today is actually his birthday. And it is the first birthday that he is going to celebrate in the free world for almost four years because uh, prior to six months ago, Ronaldo uh, was incarcerated for over 37 years, so he has deep experience in being in the Department of Corrections in Illinois uh, and serving a very, very long sentence. We're going to hear from him about that and the work that he does today. Next, we'll hear from Centoya Brown Long, who is an advocate for criminal justice reform and the author of Free Centoya. You know, Centoya was actually tried as an adult and sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole as a kid for 51 years. And she spent 15 years incarcerated, struggling to become free until her sentence was finally commuted by the Tennessee governor. We're so glad to have Centoya here today and back in the free world with us. Next, we're gonna hear from Melody Brown, who is the reentry coordinator with Free Minds Book Club and Writing Workshop in DC, one of my very favorite organizations of all time. You know, Free Minds uses literary arts and workforce development and violence prevention to connect with people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, both as youth and adults. And Melody in particular works with people in DC who are coming home from really long prison terms now, helping them to re-enter the community. And she does this while at the same time, 
She has the perspective of someone who has suffered because of a violent crime that took the life of her husband. So she brings a very unique perspective to us today. And last but not least, Robert Salim Holbrook, who is the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center in Pennsylvania. I love ALC. I have worked with them for many, many years and Salim in particular, uh, a great admirer of their campaign to end death by incarceration as well as solitary confinement and state violence. Uh, Salim is an incredible advocate and for all of you in the audience, uh, use him as a model. He is terrific. Um, but he also brings personal experience. He spent over two decades in Pennsylvania DOC uh, after being convicted as a child. And, but he returned home in 2018 and we're so glad he did because he is part of the struggle. So an exciting panel um, I, that I get to ask a question of, and I will start with you, Ronaldo. Um, you know, you spent 37 years in, in prison for a crime of violence before getting a second chance. Uh, and now you're home, you're thriving, and you're contributing to the community. Um, what does your experience as someone who, who is serving a life sentence tell us about the need to end life imprisonment in America? Let us, let us know what you think, Ronaldo. Well, thank you. First of all, I'm really honored and humbled to be here. And I will tell you that though, when I look at this panel, first of all, I wanna to say to everyone, like, like, let's keep fighting and looking forward. But I have to tell you, society has forgotten about the humanity of people. And too many children has been placed in cages because of just making bad, bad decisions. And those decisions have to be checked. But we have to remember that we recycle cans and bottles and we, 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 we do all this to build and save the, the, the environment. But we dispose of human beings. And we all have tremendous potential. In 1983, I was a functioning illiterate with a drug addict. And I was a drug addict. And so I pretty much had the mental capacity of a 12 year old with the freedoms of a 30 year old. And so I fantasized and smoked PCP and attempted not to excuse my behavior, but only to help give some clarity of how did this young kid, this young adult make such a horrible decision because I was fantasizing about getting rid of my pain that no one was able to hear or feel. You know, at the age of 15, my brother who's serving life without the possibility of parole right now as a juvenile. And so I want to see him come home, but he shot my auntie, shot my cousin, shot me and six other family members, but he was broken. And so all I'm saying to people is I'm not just a person that's responsible for horrific crime. I'm a person responsible for bringing back my humanity, awakening it up and saying, hey, there's potential left in me. There's some humanity left in me. Don't just dispose of me. Give me a chance. And there's thousands and thousands of young men and women that are not getting the chance because of such a horrible sentence. And so I think like I salute the sentencing project because you're bold, but you're right. And this is the time to move forward as the country consciousness is awakened. This is the time in which we can actually win. I think we can get rid of Elwa. And so I stand with you and I'm so grateful that I was given a chance, not because I deserve it over anyone else. I was just fortunate that we have a governor in the state of Illinois that's more progressive and didn't get frightened by the political atmosphere and say, I will grant clemencies. And so through the great work of the Illinois Prison Project, who's doing mass co uh, commutations for many different campaigns, they pushed my story. And so the true Ronaldo Hudson story came forth. And my story was not just one of a, a crime, but also of a kid who the trajectory of my life, no one saw it. But then as I began to move forward and got the chance to educate myself, I begin to see the world as I should. And there's so many people who have done the same thing, but they're rotting away in sales. And so that's why I add my voice and I'm excited about working as an advocate and a voice for not just those in Illinois, which I really appreciate, but for young men and women all over the country, they're saying, please hear my story. Don't just throw me away. Don't just dispose of me. Give me the help that I need. And I think we owe it to every person that is, is a citizen of this country to treat them as such. 
Thank you for those words, Ronaldo, and, and the kind words about TSP. But uh, let me just say, we are working with people nationwide who are in the trenches, in localities, family members, formerly incarcerated people, people who are currently incarcerated. Uh, this is a national movement. And uh, with your help and the help of others on this panel and on this webinar, uh, it's going to be a strong, unstoppable force. So thank you so much. Now I want to turn to Sintoya. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sintoya. I know that you have had a long, long journey and you fought, fought very, very hard. You know, one of the things when I, I hear Ashley talk about people uh, who are serving life in prison is that I was shocked. And let me just say, I have been an advocate for women prisoners for 25 years. But when I heard that they're the fastest growing lifer population, I, I, I couldn't explain it. Uh, I find it shocking. We're trying to dig into it more. Uh, but the truth is that women in the criminal justice system and women like and women lifers are largely ignored. Um, they are overlooked too often. When we talk about reforming the criminal legal system, we're often talking about men. We're not talking about women's unique experience of incarceration, what that does to them, what do, that does to their families, what that does to their communities. You know, based on your own experience, knowing that there are more and more women serving extreme sentences in this country, um, what can you tell us about the lives of women who are subject to these, these, this lifetime of incarceration, to this death by incarceration? What should we know uh, and how should that help us change it? Well, you should know that, you know, these women are mothers, they're daughters, they are people just like you and me, they could just as easily be your neighbor. Um, many times the perception is that these are just horrible, violent people, but, you know, the women that, that I've known um, for the 15 years that I was incarcerated and known, you know, very closely living in close quarters with them, you know, these are just women that have reacted out of trauma, women who have endured some horrible circumstances and they reacted from that place. There weren't systems in place. There weren't agencies to provide them with assistance. Um, a lot of times they were involved in domestic situations and, you know, they acted to protect themselves, but the law didn't see it as such. Um, so they come into this situation dealing out of trauma. And then once they're placed into these institutions, they're not receiving any kind of care to recover from that trauma. Um, you know, I see a lot of reports talking about, you know, mental health services in prison. I can tell you that, you know, just as healthcare in prison is horrible, so is mental health. Um, what they like to do is give you pills. That's what they like to do. They like to shove pills down your throat. That's not helpful to anyone. You have women who have been taken away from their families. Um, there are children who are growing up without their mothers. There are you know, so many things that you don't necessarily see in the family structure that's really just uprooted. And these women are still dealing with that on top of all the other trauma that they're trying to navigate. Um, and they really don't have any help from that. When you think about life sentences, especially in the state of Tennessee, where even if you don't have a life without parole, it's still pretty much life without parole. Like that is your existence. Um, there's really no opportunity to better yourself. There's no opportunity to grow. You have to fight for rehabilitation. I know before we got on, you know, Mr. Houston, he was speaking about that, how you have to want it. But even if you want it, you still have to fight for it because many times the programs that are in that, in the facility, they do the bare minimum. If they have programs so that they can get federal funding, they're only going to do the very bare minimum so they can get that federal funding. Just because they have a, let's say, construction program there for you to get certificates, that doesn't mean there's gonna be an instructor there. Maybe you have an instructor once every two weeks. That doesn't mean they're really gonna be teaching anything. Um, so there's a really a lack of programs there. And what you have are women who are just sitting there trying their best to figure out how to deal with all the trauma. Um, they don't really have a lot of help. When I left, the facility had gotten so bad where there was no assistance through the mental health departments. There was nothing for them to do to really better themselves. We didn't even have a drug treatment program that addiction had skyrocketed so bad in the facility. There were deaths. Um, the Department of Correction, of course, covered that up, but it's like, what else are they going to do? Like they're sitting there trying to put band-aids on stuff and you know, this is what they're turning to and they still don't have assistance. 
Um, so it's getting worse. It's, it's getting horrible in there. And there's not really anybody that's, that's speaking out on it. Um, when people are asking the Department of Corrections on it, obviously they're not telling the truth about it. They're just covering things up. Um, but it's really bad. And, you know, women need advocates out here. They need people to advocate for them about what they're going through on the inside and also about the sentences, the amount of time that they're spending away from their families. Thank you so much, Santoya. And let me just say, I am, I'm so glad that you are out in the community adding your voice, your experience, and importantly, your leadership. Uh, and solutions to this problem because without more women speaking out and speaking up and included in the leadership of our movements, they're gonna be left behind again. So um, let's pledge to not allow that to happen. Um, we can do better and we will. Um, so thank you so much. Next, we're gonna hear from Melody Brown. Now, Melody, you're working with men who are returning from the community. Uh, from prison, sometimes after serving many, many years for very serious crimes. Uh, but you've personally lived through the horror of having your husband murdered. And yet you were able to reconcile with the man who killed him. You know, that doesn't happen very often in our criminal legal system. There are very few opportunities for, for the, to facilitate that. And it's, it's got to be difficult for everybody involved. I'm wondering if you can share with us you know, specifically how and why you were able to support mercy and redemption uh, for the man who did kill your husband. Well, it, it, it's, it, um, it wasn't easy. It, it wasn't easy. It took, um, you know, I live right across the street from the cemetery that my husband was buried at. I live right on 16th Street right off of Mount Olive Road and he was in Mount Olive Cemetery and I would go visit him quite often um, until one time it was like my kids kept saying, you know, mom, jury would forgive him. We would have to forgive him because Junior, my husband had started out being a mentor to Junior and Junior was like a follower in the neighborhood and drugs, a lot of stuff added to it. Um, it's a fight escalated. My husband got shot, not knowing my husband was shot, but being shot with a 22, the bullet moved and bust his heart. So for 15 years and maybe longer, I felt like this boy should just rot in hell. I had no sympathy or anything for him. Um, as years moved on, he would write me. I would talk to his brother who was like, they were like night and day. Um, and I would just talk, I prayed on it. My kids forgave him. If my kids forgave him, mom, you have to forgive him. Um, I went to court with him the day that I went, I agreed to see him in court and I had an eye, eye to eye contact with him. And I said to him, if he was, if he was an actor, he was a good actor that day. Um, it's like a warm feeling I got inside. I felt forgiveness with, I, I accepted forgiveness with them. I feel as though I'll never forget because I live with that every day. Um, my daughter recently got married. Jerry wasn't there to walk her down the aisle. She bought a house, he wasn't there. Now she, she's pregnant and he's not there. Um, Junior, as I told the judge in court, you have to set this guy up for, for success, not failure. You can't set him out to release him off to the wolves to put him back in the same environment and he turns around and does the same thing again. Um, you have to have a plan for him. And the judge was very taken by how I was like a motherly figure with him in court, even though his mom was there. Um, he's doing very well. He was His time was taken all back. He was put on three years unsupervised probation. He had a very good lawyer that I still talk to to this day. Um, he has two jobs now and um, he's doing very well. And one of his jobs is he's a mentor at Oak Hill or yeah, Oak Hill. And um, he's one of those uh, youth facilities, but he's doing very well. So I have no, no, you know, ill feelings. I have no regrets and um, 
I move, I deal with it by day, each day of the, each day that goes by. I don't, you know, I think about Jerry um, because he was a great guy. Um, he's a great father and everything, but um, life goes on. But in, in, in saying that, um, did I make the right choice? I feel as though I did. I feel as though I did make the right choice. Um, as far as I work at Free Minds, Free Minds is a beautiful place. I love Free Minds. Um, it's a great nonprofit organization. And you know, they also uh, have a prison book hub. And we I work with a lot of guys. Um, a lot of the guys are our guys. And out of those 18 our guys, not one has been, been you know, re-incarcerated. Um, Free Minds is a beautiful, um, beautiful program. They have a beautiful program as far as getting the guys back into society. So, I mean, we help them with the littlest thing is trying to be, you know, turn your phone on, being able to do you know the simple tasks that we do every day. Um, it's just so much I could say about Free Minds, but we only have an hour, but yes. Um, <laughs> and I agree, yes. you know, I love Free Minds. Yeah. You know, yeah. I love Free Minds so much. But, um, um, I'm just, I'm, I feel as though everybody deserves a second look, maybe not a second chance, but I have no, no problems with Junior um, succeeding in life. And I'm glad he has the opportunity to thrive. That's a powerful story. I, I mean, I got to say, Melody, when I hear you tell that story, I think that you really supported Junior's ability to come back and thrive in the community. And that is, that's giving somebody back of life. So yes. thank you. And You're thank welcome. you for all you, the work that you do at Free Minds with so many uh, of the folks who are coming back after they've gotten a, a second chance because of the laws in DC. Yes. Which we wish we had more of in other jurisdictions. DC is really leading the way. We are I, I live in DC, I'm a citizen of DC, and most of the staff in TS, at TSPR, and we are very proud of, of our home for taking this measure for mercy and redemption uh, and de-incarceration. Yes, so welcome. thank you for participating today. Melody. You're welcome. Salim, again, last but, but not least, uh, it's so great to see you today and so great to speak with you. you know, I know ALC has really been at the forefront of, of working to end death by incarceration in Pennsylvania and be, really being a national voice for reforming our entire punishment paradigm. Um, and you know things are starting to change. It's really exciting, especially in the reform of juvenile life without parole. And we've got the Supreme Court rulings, we've seen state pass laws and, and frankly hundreds of people who committed their crimes before the age of 18 have, have gotten a second chance to go home and so many of them are thriving in the community. Um, but that does beg the question, especially for those of, of us who, who want to see second chances and the ability to come home for everyone, really. Um, how, do we, how do we build on the success of JLWAP? What do we learn from the JLWAP movement to really end death by incarceration for everyone in the United States? Well, first, I know that's a hard question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, first, thank you for having me on here, Amy. I always love working with the Sentencing Project. This is something, this is a relationship that precedes my release. It goes back to when I was still in those cages. And I remember Ashley sending in those surveys and my sister talking to Ashley and being a part of that national movement to end death by incarceration. Um, I also, Amy, I do want to correct you. And you know, you as someone who, I love and we we throw down a lot, but I will say that with ALC, with ALC, we are not interested in reforming the punishment system. We are interested in dismantling and abolishing it. And I know that the sentence yeah. is there with <laughs> us too. So um, just gonna put that out there. And also too, Excellent. I would be remiss if I did not also uh, announced that ALC has just brought a new player into this fight. Last year, we started a new C4 called Straight Ahead that will be our lobbying arm to bring abolitionist lobbying to Harrisburg and Pennsylvania. Um, so to answer your question, Ashley, I mean, uh, Amy, the movement that brought me home was a movement composed of family members, prisoners on the inside, and activists who were committed to 
ending a practice that was a draconian sentence and was a human rights violation. Now, that movement moved the United States Supreme Court to issue the ruling in Miller versus Alabama that paved the way for thousands of us to be resentenced and released. And that ruling essentially said that children are not incorrigible, that they possess the capacity for change and growth. Now, how do we apply this to the movement to end life sentences today? My argument, and I believe our argument, is that that ruling is not exclusive to children. We have seen that for people who have been in prison for 30 and 40 years, we have seen remarkable capacity for change in people who have been in prison that long. People who have committed horrible offenses and who we are not saying should not be held accountable. What we are merely asking is for individual hearings, individual assessments to make a determination if the person sitting across from the parole board today who more likely than not in Pennsylvania is gonna be someone who was in his 50s and has been in prison for over 35 years, if that person is not the same person he or she was when they were 18, 19, or 20 when they committed their offense. And we believe that based on the juvenile lifers that have been released, many of us coming home in our 40s and our 50s, unfortunately, many in their 60s too, have shown that that capacity for change is there, that we were not the person that we were, in my case, 27 years ago. Um, in Joe Legan's case, what was it? I don't even, I can't even, I don't even know how long it was. He went to prison in 1953 and he just got out this year. He went to prison in 1953 and was just released this year, 70 something years old, right? So what we are asking for that capacity for change to be shown in front of a parole board. Now, other areas that we can, this, this applies to is this, decarcerating lifers, seniors, is actually a public safety initiative because, and this is something that Ashley I'm sure could roll the stats because Ashley is a stat machine, could talk about how you age out of crime. You age out of that type of behavior. People who are released in their late 40s, their late 50s, their late 60s, their recidivism rate drops into the single digits, right? So if you're talking about public safety, which group to release that is going to come back to our community with the least likelihood of reoffending, it is lifers who have been in prison for 30 or 40 years, and more importantly, have been held accountable. Because we're just, again, I believe in accountability, right? I'm a prison abolitionist, but I still believe that if you commit harm, you must be held accountable. That, and that's a process, I had to go through that process. The prison system didn't teach me accountability. I dealt with that myself. And this takes us to the narrative, and I'm gonna wrap it up with this. There is no wall between victims and offenders in our community. And any agency, any person that tries to reinforce that wall or build that wall is someone that is in opposition to our communities. Because I'm someone that went to prison at the age of 16 years old for being a, a lookout to a homicide. However, I also lost two cousins to homicides within one year in Philadelphia. So my family was on both sides of this issue. When I was in the courtroom and I turned around and looked at the courtroom behind me, I knew everyone in that courtroom. We all knew each other. The victim's family, my family, my co all of us were from the same neighborhood. We all knew each other. They were sitting on the side with the prosecutor. We were, our families were on side with the defense. When we left out of that courtroom, we all left traumatized, in misery, and we took all of that back to our same neighborhood, right? So for us, it is very important that we talk about how harm and violence is interwoven within each and every family, within each and every neighborhood in our community, and that we have to 
adopt a paradigm of justice that is based on restorative justice, recognizing the harm that has been created and restoring uh, like healing to, 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 to families on both sides and also transformative justice. So those are some lessons that I would share from what we're doing in Pennsylvania that I believe is a model that others could emulate. I don't believe that it's the golden geese that's gonna work everywhere, but I believe that these are some points that people fighting these campaigns in their state can take back because as long as we have the victim and the uh, uh, versus offender binary, we're going to continue per, 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 perpetuating that harm in our community and have no closure. And families are just going to leave from them courtrooms further encased and trapped in their trauma and pain. When I was sentenced to life without parole as a child, my family left that courtroom in pain. The victim's family momentarily had a hurrah moment. But when they left out that courtroom, they were also in pain. And that pain went back to my neighborhood. And to an extent to this day, fortunately, some of it is resolved. But the state did nothing to resolve that. That's, those are powerful words, Salim. Uh, and it reminds me of you know, the ongoing struggle to really look for a better way of doing this. I mean, the line between those who are harmed and those who are doing the harm is so porous. Um, the role of trauma, the role of abuse, the role of structural violence uh, that we know is hurting us and our communities and yet, and yet we do nothing to actually prevent it. Uh, instead, we just lock people up. Um, I, I keep saying, hey, that was a 19th century solution uh, and we're in the 21st century. It's time for all of us to rethink this entire project and to do better because, oh my goodness, could we do worse? Uh, you'd have to try. In fact, I think sometimes we have. Um, so those are amazing words from everybody. And uh, we have been getting so many questions in the q and I'm glad we have some time together to go over them. I'm scanning through quickly and I will apologize in advance if we don't get all, to all of these questions, we couldn't possibly. Uh, but one question really struck me because I think that each of the panelists is gonna have some thoughts about this question. It's certainly something I think about a lot and we are at the Sentencing Project very intentionally uh, working in this area and want to do more. And the question is, what can the men and women behind the walls in prison do from inside to initiate action and support this movement? Um, and when I see this question, my, my immediate reaction is, how can we make sure that our movements on the outside include people on the inside too? Uh, what's the best way to do that, to facilitate it, uh, and, and to ensure that and, and to ensure that folks who are on the inside stay safe at the same time? Centoya, I have a feeling you have something to say. Yes. Um, so one of the things that I always stress is that when you're, you've experienced something like your experience, that, that makes you the expert on that. So the voices of those who are incarcerated, the voices of those who are formerly incarcerated, like that needs to be the guiding point for any kind of movement. They need to be included in that discussion and not just included, they need to be leading that discussion. Whenever we were working on legislation here in Tennessee for juvenile life sentences, um, we actually worked with another organization here in Tennessee that would that sent letters to each and every single juvenile who was serving a life sentence, um, asking you know, for their input, asking if they wanted to participate. We actually had people from that organization who were talking to them, spent time talking to them, asking them, what is it that you need us to advocate for? What is it that you would like to contribute? Would you like to have your voice, like including them, like do the work to actually reach out don't just think because, okay, I went to college or, you know, this is the work that I'm interested in. Like, I got this, I can do it. No, they need to be included. Their voice needs to be included. Um, and a lot of times that's going to come with you having to reach out and reach into them because it's very hard for them to reach out to you sometimes. Um, that's just the way the prison is. They can't just pick up a phone and call anybody. If you're not on the list or things like that, they may not necessarily have the resources to find 
how to get in contact with the sentencing project, but you have all the resources that you can locate them, you can get in touch with them and you can invite them in. Those are great suggestions. And I wonder, I know Salim, I have worked with you uh, in particular that with Pennsylvania having a, a very robust uh, activist scene in the prisons, lifers groups. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how that works in Pennsylvania? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, when I was in prison, I'll be straight, we had a saying amongst ourselves that we are our own liberators. And that saying comes from uh, Jalal Mutaquin, a political prisoner from New York who was just released after serving close to 50 years of a life sentence in New York. Um, as well as Russell Maroon Schultz, another political prisoner here in Pennsylvania. Um, they really motivated us that no one is gonna fight harder for you in those cages than you and your families. And in Pennsylvania, we took that to bear and we took it very seriously. Um, and I think that where its impact really played out the greatest was when it meshed with a lot of national groups like the Sentencing Project, National Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, um, ACLU. I mean, it was so many groups who were involved in the campaign to, to end juvenile life without parole, but we had a very robust um, activist network that was already in place and was organic. Um, the Human Rights Coalition, from that came Decarcerate PA, the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration. Um, we had family members of juvenile lifers who were having meetings in living rooms over dinner with others. So we had a very strong organizing history going back 20, 30 years in Pennsylvania. It was connected with the larger issue of racial injustice um, in this country. And we was just very fortunate um, a, a combination of right time and right place that it, 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 it meshed into like a perfect storm for us up here. And Ronaldo, I know you were also a prison activist. It's amazing. There's, there's a theme here. Uh, activists are activists everywhere. Uh, what would you suggest from based on your experience? Well, I would say, first of all, I am an activist. I wasn't like, uh, I want to be clear, clear about that because one of the things we did in, in our doing in Illinois is I actually formulated a program called the Building Block in Illinois. In fact, uh, what it is, it was a program that was designed and ran by incarcerated citizens. And what we discovered was that as much as people were being employed by the department to teach classes, they simply didn't know how to relate to us. And in many cases, we didn't want to hear from them because many of them went from being officers to counselors. And so we like, man, you're indifferent. You don't even care about my true rehabilitation or liberation, right? And I stand with when the brothers say liberation, I believe in that struggle. So I believe in accountability, responsibility. And so we formulated a program that exists on five principles, respect, responsibility, ownership, community, and empathy. And so within that space, we were able to educate people about their civil rights, right? Like you have the right to grieve, to file a grievance. You have a right to file a clemency, the, right? You have a right to appeal, right? You have a right to call staff to stand according to the code of professional responsibility. And so education became an extreme weapon because when I walked in prison in 1983, I couldn't read or write. Okay, I was a functioning illiterate. When I walked out of prison on September the 2nd of 2020, I walked out with my bachelor in divinity, right? And I have, and that's just the, the social public accolades, right? But personally, I walked out with a PhD in understanding the insanity of incarceration. And so I'm a proponent of supporting, how do you deal with trauma, right? How do you teach people about the splendors that come from traumatic experiences that people don't wanna talk about because they can't necessarily see them. So the most powerful weapon my peers have all in these prisons is first to educate themselves, quit looking for the system to do for you. They survive on your incarceration. And so you have to understand, you have to focus on liberation and we are the best teachers. 
I definitely support the idea of connecting with organizations, but that's not always possible because I remember many, many years when groups didn't have access to us. And so we had to try to figure out how do we begin to teach our peers to read? So we started a tutoring class in the day room where people was playing cards. We started standing in with a dictionaries and we started doing a math class and we started a Spanish think tank and we started the veterans think tank and the youth think tank. And all the ideas for rehabilitation began to come out of us. And so I was excited and I'm continue to be excited about continually like being forward and saying, we want to see the walls come down on incarceration and we are the best advocates. Because when you look at me, I don't look like an incarcerated person, but that's only because of the cultivation that occurred through people that choose to, chose to love me rather than to condemn me. And I chose to accept responsibility because I equally say, Listen, to those that are victims of crime, I'm sorry I wasn't a better human being, but I was a broken kid that didn't understand the criminality of my conduct and the way it had an impact on them. But now that I do, I get to talk to my peers and say, hey, step up and own your stuff. It stink, it smells, right? And so prison is a sewage. We need to figure out how to flush the toilet. And so life without the possibility of parole is the constant stain of our government not willing to say, we're not going to employ people over the incarceration of people. We're gonna employ people because they're doing, we want everyone in this country to have the best life. So anyway, through self uh, education, right? And connecting with your peers around you and calling them to be a responsible person and say, quit running around playing with yourself. You know what you did, right? Don't be afraid to own it because you have to own it before you can burn it, right? And so I'm a believer in simply saying, we can be better. I love the fact that you have capped at 20 years because I did 37 years, right? I was ready at 20 years to be free. And so I'm so grateful that people are talking about that now, but I know so many people and I have to keep mentioning this. I was the victim of a crime trying to heal myself and I self attempted to self-medicate which caused me to end up taking a life. I'm responsible for that, but I didn't get away with it. I own it. I take the shame of it. People still want to say, are oh, you a horrible person? The act was horrible. It absolutely was. But I'm not a horrible person. I just did a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. I am a loving person that shows that beauty can come from ashes. And so to everyone that keeps saying, we can't trust them, keep watching and keep fighting. And I am an abolitionist. I say, in incarceration, right? And bring our children and our brothers and sisters home. And we're only going to do that if we stay bold and courageous and say, despite yesterday, today will be better. The sun will come out when we stand together and lock arms and demand the best of our government officials and not simply let them come out and hug us and kiss us during elections, right? But when it's time to make that real decision, call them to it. Mm -hmm. Ronaldo, I can tell that you are a preacher. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you got me standing in my seat here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank I you just so love much it. for that. Thank you yes, so much. For Absolutely. That. Now, Melody, we, we, we've got a question for you too. And, and this has been raised in a lot of the answers that we heard from Ronaldo and Centoya and, and Celine. People in the audience are looking for suggestions on how to help victims' families come to a point where they can reach forgiveness. You've told us about your story. How would you advise other people to, to bring, bring forgiveness into their, their lives and support people who are both perpetrators and victims? Prayer, prayer, and prayer. Because for so many years, I hated this kid. It could bring tears to my eyes now. I wanted this kid to rot in the hell. I used to sit and think of ways or ways to have him killed in jail and all kind of crazy stuff. Um, I prayed on it. And my kids, my daughters, one of my daughters is a police officer. She was like, Mom, I want to be a police. Um, Daddy would forgive him. Daddy would forgive him. I said, well, I don't have to forgive him. I prayed on it and I talked. I would go to the cemetery and the guys who worked in the cemetery, they knew I wasn't crazy. 
because I'd be having whole conversations and it took a lot. It took a lot. Um, talking to the person, talking to the, the um, I talked, I ended up talking to his family. His brother was helped a lot because I was pretty close to his brother. And he would always tell me the progress and stuff on Junior. And it just took a lot. It, take, it takes a toll on you. But I had beautiful daughters that stuck by me and kept pressing me out. And I mean, pressing me out to the point that I was like, um, I have to forgive this child because he was a kid. And not just so much he was a kid, he was a follower. Um, so being in this old, that said, it's just, it's not easy. And all I can say is talk it out, talk it out, express your feelings because the more you keep it in, that's not gonna help. You know, you got to vent, you got to express it. And I'm like, I don't want to forgive him. I don't want to. So I ended up forgiving him. And like I said, I have no regrets and I'm glad. And working at Free Minds, I talked to a lot of these guys that have done violent crimes, like um, Mr. Renato said. And I'm like, and they were like, well, Melody, you forgave someone. Would you have get, forgave me? I'm like, and looking at them now, I would be like, um, I think I would. Working here has really helped. It's given me a better perspective of, 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 of a lot of things. Um, wow, Free Minds is, has been a blessing. Um, it's opened up in a lot of ways for me and myself because it's just a hard experience and something that seeing that your loved one is killed in front of you and saying, are you, did you do the right thing? Are you a damn fool to forgive him? You know, people still say, a lot of people say I'm a fool, but I don't think I'm a fool. I know I made the right decision and I feel good about it, but it, yeah. prayer, prayer and talking about it helps a lot. Yeah. And I mean, Melody, hearing you just it reminds me that that we have so few opportunities that we built so few opportunities in in our current system to allow anyone to heal, uh, and that should actually be the purpose of the entire system, but we have not done that. So we have time for one more question, and I thought, in the spirit of pushing the envelope and pushing the sentencing project to be bold and all of us to be bold, I have a question here that says. 20 year cap seems like it's a really long time. Can't you do better than that? Uh, and so I'm gonna open it up for Ashley. <laughs> um, well, 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 the 20 year cap, um, why 20 years? What's the rationale? Is there, is there a chance that, that we could bring that down someday too? Yeah, I uh, thanks and thanks to the person who asked. It's a difficult question um, because there's, you know, in my heart and mind, I, I wish that we had a system that could look uh, carefully and individually at every single person. And if we're going to insist on a system that doesn't do that, we need to get, put the pressure on the prison to fix the person um, instead of just letting individuals languish in prisons forever. Um, and so this gives, in my mind, uh, prisons more than enough time to do all the uh, work that they need to do on the individual who has committed a uh, serious and violent crime. Um, and that that upper cap would lower down all of the sentences beneath it so that, you know, um, a robbery, which would normally, you know, get maybe two years, uh, is, it would not get um, it would get two years, maybe in another country, wouldn't get, you know, 15 years here. So we would get a system that was more proportionate. We know that in the vast majority of people who do commit crime, who are at risk, who are even those who are considered to be chronic offenders, uh, age out and rehabilitate themselves out um, after a period of as short as 10 years, but certainly after 20. So it begs the question of what kind of system could we have if we actually were focusing on on rehabilitation because so much of what we've heard today is people people are doing it against all the odds 
changing themselves, coming out uh, after being brutalized, frankly, in prison. But what if we actually had a system that focused on helping people, focused on preventing violence, focused on solving the issues? What a world that would be. Uh, and that's what other countries are doing. It's not, this wouldn't be inventing real. I mean, we right. could just look to other countries that are doing it successfully. We can and must do so much better. And thank you, everyone, the panelists, you were amazing. Uh, every time I watch a, a TSP webinar, I have a tendency to actually get teared up uh, because the truths are strong. Um, and what you all tell us is so amazing. Um, hey, this is Amy, the first of many conversations. Yes, Renee. Can I say in closing, just a major point. I spent 13 years on death row. When my rehabilitation started, it was because I didn't want to die being good for nothing. And so that, when people talk about every day in prison is torturous, it's the crowdest place in the world, but the loneliest place in the world. Mm -hmm. And people have to understand, you can't torture people into rehabilitation. You have to cultivate an environment that is conducive to change. And I want to make sure people understand that. Like, don't say that you want me to not be a monster, but you treat me like a monster and then expect me to walk out of prison sane. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's vitally important that people remember that the change that occurs occurs because the cultivating, the space cultivated the opportunity for that change. They told me when I asked the director to, can I go to school to learn to read and write? We're going to execute you. Why would we educate you? When they gave me, that was when I had the death penalty, when I had life without the possibility of parole, they said, you got too much of a times a sentence to educate you. Yeah. Get out of the way. Those are the truths that people have to talk about. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about them right here. I can't wait to continue this discussion with all of you at another point and to work with each and every one of you uh, to end extreme sentencing in the United States. We know the harm. Now let's start doing the good. Thank you all. Take care.